Good morning and welcome to worship at Rhine Congregational United Church of Christ. We believe that whoever you are or wherever you are on your life's journey, there is a place for you here in our midst. Um, I know we have a couple of announcements, so Cheryl, I'll turn it over to you, and it looks like Sam has one too. I just want to remind you that the November branching out is a collection of new or gently worn um, hats, gloves, blankets, coats for the people of the Pine Ridge Reservation. Kevin Alvarez is spearheading this for the entire town and we're trying to um, take part in that. Uh, the last Sunday to donate things is November 21st um, and there's a box there in the narthex. We already have quite a few donations. If you prefer to donate some money for the expenses they have taken in there, you can write a check to the church for the Pine Ridge in the memo and put it in the offering or leave it in the office. Thank you. So we are in need of some adult um, and youth, young adult volunteers to be a part of the program. So if that's something that you're interested in or willing to help uh, with, please email uh, the church office and let Sherry know that you're interested and uh, she will let me know and I will reach out to you and let you know what um, kind of roles that we need to be able to fill and see what you'd be interested in. Thank you. Good morning. Many of you know my story, but some of you might not, so I'll refresh your memory. Our family moved here from Lawrence, Kansas, just about 40 years ago. We had no family here. The only people we knew were Bruce's employer and the people I interviewed with for a teaching position at Lincoln Public Schools. We'd been involved in the UCC church in Lawrence, so we thought that would be a good place to begin. We visited every UCC church that was in Lincoln at that time. And it was a very eye-opening experience. Not all UCC churches are the same. Our church in Lawrence had been a very family-focused and welcoming place. Everyone was friendly and warm and we felt like we had a home there, so that's what we had hoped for here. We didn't experience that in all the churches here. And there was also a concern when we visited these churches that we wanted a program that had an active program for youth because we had a daughter who was 11 years old at the time. When we came to Vine, we felt at home almost immediately. We were welcomed very warmly and greeted by many, many people. And probably some of you might still be in those pews today because I see faces that have, we have a lot of history with. The message was very clear. As George said, no matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. It was a breath of fresh air for us. We joined within a few months and we're still here. It's been our church home for 39 years. That's really a long time. And it dawned on me just 17 days ago, I celebrated my 77th birthday. I've been a member of Vine Church for more than half my life. And I have to tell you, uh, Vine has been our church home for more than half my life. I've always felt accepted and welcome, even though my opinions and views might not be the same as others. Vine is my church family, complete with consensus, disagreements, sorrows, 
joys, and all the other quirks that make up a family, warts and all. The people that mine are who make all the difference. We've experienced a great deal of uncertainty in this church family, and somehow we pull together to keep this family together. We can agree to disagree and still be a family. We help each other when it's needed, expand that caring to others in our wider community. We've experienced many changes together, and some of those changes have resulted in sadness, but we've continued to be resilient and worked to maintain our presence and commitment to our church family. Our stewardship campaign is the time for each of us to reflect personally about Vine and the importance of this place and its members to us. Providing a home for a church and its family requires a budget, and that budget can fluctuate just like a household budget. The life of Vine is in our hands. It's up to us. As each of you think what mine means to you personally, also think about what you mean to the rest of us. We are the church together, as the words in the hymn tell us. Please give consideration about how you can contribute to mine's budget and pledge to do our able but remember this, most of all, you are always welcome here. Thank you. There is one more announcement, and that is to remind you to uh, look at the call to the congregational meeting, which will be held next Sunday, November 14th, uh, and it will be the provisional budget meeting and election, and also uh, recommended uh, changes to the bylaws. We hope to see all of you here.
we gather in your house, gracious God, we pray for your love and compassion to abound as we walk through these challenging times. We ask for your wisdom for those who bear the load of making decisions with widespread consequences, especially our search committee as they deliberate about the next chapter in Vine's life. We pray for those who are suffering with sickness and all who are caring for them. And we ask for protection for the elderly and vulnerable to not succumb to the risks of the virus. We exercise the good sense that you and your mercy provide. May we approach each day with, in faith and peace, trusting in the truth of your goodness toward us. Amen. Shall we pray? Holy God, we are gathered in worship with the understanding that you see us and hear us. Through our masks, you see if we smile or if we scowl. Through our masks, you hear if we whisper a brief prayer or mutter a discouraging, discouraging word. Our friends don't see or hear or know, nor do our families, nor our colleagues, but you do. These masks take away power, the power of clear communication, but also the power to infect others. They also grant us freedom to be with our own personal smiles, our thoughts, our mumbles. When the disease that moves us to mask our faces fades away, will our eyes and ears be stronger and better able to see the smiles and frowns of others, to hear the cries and whispers of those who fill our lives, who make our lives worth living. Loving God, our inability to find you in the rush of our lives is our inability to see you in all the wonders you show us, and our incapacity to hear your gentle voice in the tumult that surrounds us. Through our time together in worship, may we come to know that even in times when there isn't a pandemic, we put on many masks so we can cope, avoid, pretend, be acceptable. Help us, gracious God, to move beyond our masks. You are here for us to see and hear. Help us. Let us take off our masks. Presence. 
I found that my friend, who lived just a couple of houses away from me, had given me one of her favorite toys. And I thought, why would she give me her favorite toy? And I found out later she did that because she didn't have money to buy a gift. So she gave me something that was special to her. So I want you guys to kind of help me tell the story that we learned this morning. What happened in our story? What were the people doing? Um, yeah, they were giving gifts to Jesus. They were dropping the money for the church in the box. And what happened when the widow went up to the box? gave what she had. She gave the two coins that she had, and she did it very quietly, didn't she? She didn't want them to know about it. But who noticed her gift? Who noticed it? There was someone at the church, that at the temple that morning, that noticed her and took those two coins, because Jesus did. And he told everyone that that was very special that she did that, that that was a great gift, because she gave what she had. So we want to remember that our small actions sometimes can mean a lot to people, right? That no matter what we have, we can find some way to help. So let's say a prayer. Dear God, help us to remember our small acts can make a big difference. That all God's children say. Amen. And can you show them what the work we did this morning? We did some coin rubbings with some foreign coins that we had, and we did some pictures with leaves. So, okay, I've got a treat for you. <laughs> First scripture reading for today is from Jeremiah 32, 6 through 15. Jeremiah said, God's message came to me like this. Prepare yourself. Hanamel, your uncle Shalom's son, is on his way to see you. He is going to say, buy my field in Anathoth. You have the legal right to buy it there. Sure enough, just as God had said, my cousin Hanamel came to me while I was in jail and said, Buy my field in Anathoth in the territory of Benjamin, for you have the legal right to keep it in the family. Buy it. Take it over. That did it. I knew it was God's message. So I bought the field at Anathoth from my cousin Hanamel. I paid him 17 silver shekels. I followed all the proper procedures. In the presence of witnesses, I wrote out the bill of sale, sealed it, and weighed out the money on the scales. Then I took the deed of purchase, the sealed copy that contained the contract and its conditions, and also the open copy, and gave them to Baruch, son of Neriah, the son of Messiah. All this took place in the presence of my cousin Hanel and the witnesses who had signed the deed, as the Jews who were at the jail that day looked on. Then, in front of all of them, I told Baruch, These are orders from God of the angel armies, the God of Israel. Take these documents, both the sealed and the open deeds, and put them for safekeeping in a pottery jar. For God of the angel armies, the God of Israel, says, Life is going to return to normal. Homes and fields and vineyards are again going to be bought in this country. Our second scripture reading for today is from 1 Peter 4, 12 through 16. Friends, when life gets really difficult, don't jump to the conclusion that God isn't on the job. Instead, be glad that you are in the very thick of what Christ experienced. This is a spiritual refining process with glory just around the corner. 
If you're abused because of Christ, count yourself fortunate. It's the Spirit of God and His glory in you that brought you to the notice of others. If they're on you because you broke the law or disturbed the peace, that's a different matter. But if it's because you're a Christian, don't give it a second thought. Be proud of the distinguished status reflected in that image. These are the scriptures for today. May we bring the word of God in them for us. It's time for joys and concerns, and this morning I'm going to do something a little different. Um, I'm going to take this mic, and I'm going to come down into the congregation, and first I'll ask, does anyone have any joys they wish to share? joy and still a little concerned but the joy is Kendra survived her surgery our daughter had neck surgery because she had a mass on it and fortunately the mass was benign and she's home and and doing fairly well it's just that she's not supposed to do anything for at least four weeks so now I'm just asking prayers for we are asking prayers for patience <laughs> not to do too much, and that's hard when you're used to doing things, but thank you for all your prayers. She felt them and she was very thankful. I kept telling her how many of you had mentioned that, so thank you. And are there any concerns? Or I should say other concerns. silent prayer as we focus our thoughts and our emotions and then I will share the prayers of the people. O oh God, our God, Sometimes we kid ourselves and pretend we're not in a state of shock as a result of COVID-19, but we are. The world as we knew it is gone, and for what feels like such a long time, we have experienced so much hardship during this pandemic. As we prepare to walk into the future with you always by our side and a new minister in our midst, we pray for a new normal to arrive. May our hearts be unified in you more than ever and empower us to see those we know and love and worship with, to see them again the first time with eyes of deeper faith. May these tender moments of seeing someone again in person be all the more rich and treasured. May the reunions be times of saying, welcome home, I've missed you. May the interactions be grace-filled so we look forward to moments that are ahead, eager to discover what God has in store for us. Loving God, may we turn to you in sincere gratitude. Help us to come out of this pandemic as better people, not bitter people. Help us to become more considerate of others. We thank you that no matter how dark the night may be,
there is the hope of the dawn to come. Gracious Spirit, with love and respect for the past, we as a community of faith face our new beginnings and our new journeys with anticipation, optimism, enthusiasm, and care for each other. And by doing so, create our new normal here at Vine. Amen. And now, may we pray the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever.
a mighty army was poised to invade Jerusalem and place the city under siege. That army was coming from the north, and the city of Jerusalem and its people were in big trouble. Meanwhile, the prophet of God, Jeremiah, was sitting in jail, put there by the king, who had no interest in hearing what Jeremiah was saying, because Jeremiah was prophesying that this army was on its way. But the king didn't want to hear it, and so he locked Jeremiah up. And into that scene stepped a man named Hanamel, who happened to be Jeremiah's cousin. Now, Hanamel was the owner of a field he wanted to sell. Why the rush to dispose of real estate? Well, Jeremiah had been telling the people that the city was about to be sacked. Many lives would be lost. And if you were a refugee, what would you want to carry? Annabelle wanted to carry money, portable wealth. He didn't want a piece of land. He wanted to get out of Dodge. Annabelle went to the jail to see Jeremiah, and Jeremiah did the unthinkable. He purchased the field, knowing that a foreign army was about to invade the city. He had two deeds prepared, as we heard in Scripture, and they were signed and sealed and delivered, and the exact amount of money was weighed and placed in the account of Hananel. The deeds were witnessed and signed, and Jeremiah had them placed in two earthenware jars, which were again sealed for safekeeping. Now, why, I ask, why did Jeremiah do that? He said himself that his actions were symbolic intending to foretell that one day the nation would be restored and there would be a new normal. Here is a message of hope in the face of impending doom. Now let's hear from the letter of First Peter. First Peter was a letter sent to churches to encourage believers when trouble comes their way. And from the perspective of the author of 1 Peter, trouble is certain. So it must be met not with surprise, but with glory to God. Interestingly enough, trouble can bring us into a more intimate fellowship with Christ in his sufferings. God does not cause suffering. It happens for some other reason. But how we deal with suffering can bring glory to God and to ourselves. During the past 20 months, the world has been under siege by a powerful foe. To place the pandemic in perspective, I ask you to consider a fully loaded jumbo jet with not one vacant seat. And it crashes in the United States with no survivors. If seven fully loaded jumbo jets 
crashed in the United States every single day of every week of every month for the past 20 months with no survivors. That number of deaths would total 725,000. The number of white flags being flown on the National Mall in Washington, D.C. Now, now that I've said that, I have to correct myself. Because I started working on this sermon a week ago, in the early part of this week, and on Wednesday, new numbers came, came up. The number of flags on the National Mall has now increased to 750,000. Recalculate, because now it's eight jumbo jets, fully loaded, no empty seat, crash in the United States every day of every week of every month for the past 20 months with no survival. I submit to you that for the past 20 months, the whole world has been living through a very dark winter. A time when our capacity for coping has been stretched to the limit. The world as we've known it has been turned inside out and we have come face to face with just how fragile life and on top of that, we have had to adjust to the cruel reality of isolation in all aspects of life. We were proud, and rightly so, when a name, COVID-19, was finally given to this silent predator. But today we realize that COVID-19 is not a single, solitary and adversary. Instead, it's more like a family, because now its cousins, called variants, have come into our midst to assault us. The pandemic is our country's third leading killer. Children are being orphaned. One in 500 children in, the, in this country has lost a primary caregiver in the past 20 months. And for minorities, that number is higher. Husbands and wives are becoming widows and widowers far too soon. Much loved people of all ages have died without family members at the bedside while doctors and nurses and other hospital personnel have had to become surrogates for family members in order that patients don't die alone. The numbers of losses overwhelm us. In addition to the 750,000 I just mentioned, 2.5 million females have exited this country's workforce. Jobs are lost, people are on furlough from their employment, people are un unable to hang out with their friends. Funerals, funerals as we've known them, are different or non-existent. We've been cut off from family members, unable to spend quality time with our grandchildren and great-grandchildren. Diane and I just learned that our five-year-old great-granddaughter and her father are quarantined at home with COVID-19. Nationally and internationally, loneliness abounds in people's hearts and souls. We rejoice over the life-giving aspects of vaccine and 
their booster counterparts and were eager to move on in anticipation of what's next in life. But our ability to deal with and process thoughts and feelings and sentiments that, that had surfaced during the pandemic need time. So we require patience. Patience to realize that grief has its own timetable and needs its own timetable in order to begin its work within us. I venture to say that many of us here today are trying to remain afloat in a sea of losses. The word lose means to cease to have, to be deprived of someone or something badly missed, which one regards to be essential for well-being. Perhaps most telling is that the word lost means unable to find your way. I've talked to a few people from various churches and honestly they don't know how to proceed in the future. Will, will my church be the same? Will the same people still be there? If you have experienced COVID, perhaps you've experienced what is called COVID fog. And you know what I mean about it, that feeling of being lost. Disorientation overcomes a person. I remember driving into Hallam, Nebraska after the Hallam tornado. Now I had been to Hallam any number of times. I knew the community and I knew my way around that town, but that day as I drove into town, I couldn't find my way because the street signs were gone and so many familiar buildings had been destroyed. I was lost smack dab in the middle of that little town. Feeling like you're lost can be part of grief. For you see, grief is not one dimensional. Grief is a constellation of feelings and emotions and actions and guilt and memories and deep sorrow and yearning and anger and yes, even relief. Think of the deep sorrow of family members left behind when the ventilator stops beeping. Think of the deep sorrow of missing ones we love at night because it is well known that nighttime is the prime time for loneliness coming to call. You may know and live with the reality of seeing the empty place at the dinner table. Or you may live and know the reality of having the space next to you in bed be empty. You know, when it comes to grief, there's a misguided notion that who and what we've lost should, we, should be dealt with in short order. And folks will just move on. I'm thinking of the typical employee benefit of having three days leave following the death of a family and how limited family leave short circuits the grieving process. I'm thinking, thinking about callous remarks from friends, co-workers, even family members who make comments like, 
aren't you over that yet? We need to be reminded that grief is not a moment in time. That grief is not a destination. That grief is not over and done with. It is a lifelong journey. The pandemic has created its own vocabulary. And one phrase that has been tossed around quite a bit is long hauler. The long haulers are persons who have had COVID, but then end up with cardiac and lung problems and other physical ailments that require medical attention over an extended period of time. I submit to you that when it comes to grief, all of us are long haulers. The fabric of life as we've known it has been torn apart. And as I said moments ago, it's not unusual to feel lost and unable to find our way in the face of deep sorrow. Neither is it unusual to ask for help when you need it. In fact, to say help may be the bravest thing we will ever do. There are indications that the world's dark winter may be coming to an end as we hope for light at the end of the tunnel when it comes to the pandemic. That light appears to be here in the development of vaccines which have been used to inoculate masses of people. And now on the news, I'm hearing that companies are coming out with antidotes in pill form. Yet I ask you to ponder some other considerations. Is it possible to inoculate against the pain of losing someone you love or something you love? I think not. Are there any pills or shots capable of healing a hole in a person's soul? I don't believe so. The world yearns to return to normal, and yet COVID has set the bar so high that we have begun to ask, what is normal? Will the old normal ever appear again? The worst thing about COVID is not knowing how and when it will end, because I have faith that it is going to end, but how, when, or what it will be like is unknown because we're not going back to the way things were. We don't know what has been lost. So that complicates our grieving. We know part of what we're grieving for, but the rest is unknown. Whether COVID and company goes away or emerges as the new normal, it's incumbent on us to learn to make friends with our grief. In other words, to learn to live with it because change is part of life. And change brings some form of loss. And loss produces grief. When my sister's son, Zach, was five years of age, he went to visit my brother at his house. And Zach went inside the house and he looked around and he said to my brother, Uncle Wayne, did you move? Wayne said, no, Zachary, we didn't move. We've lived here for a long time. Why did you think we moved? And Zach said, because there used to be a dish of candy on that table. Zach occupied himself for the next half hour by looking around the house for the dish of candy. He never found it. 
life keeps moving the candy dish on us and takes us to places we would rather not go and experiences we'd rather not go through but it produces opportunity as well dr george everly faculty member at johns hopkins school of medicine studied diverse groups of people who endured chronic adversity and discovered that the most resilient people in those groups possessed a common denominator, a specific resilient attitude which is best kept, captured in the maxim, life is a journey, not a destination. Everly goes on to say that if we define our lives in relation to a vaccine or herd immunity, we will surely be disappointed. We will, it, it, all that will never arrive fast enough. However, if we see the pandemic as a yet undetermined segment of our journey, a journey that must be endured, we may not only survive psychologically and physically, we may actually grow stronger in our faith. So, I like to think of pandemic as a milestone in our lives. Let's take a few moments to explore what we're learning from that milestone. Consider with me that we're learning the importance of generosity. We're learning the importance of gratitude. We're learning humility and how individuals are stepping forward with acts of kindness to make life better for people they have never met. On a worldwide scale, a prime example of this is how restaurateurs and chefs have united together to feed needy people they've never met, people impacted by COVID. And at the same time, there's also a need to feed people's spirits and emotions, to bring balm to the holes in people's souls. I believe hope abounds in us and around us, and it abounds in such quantity to enable you and I to do the very thing I've just been talking about, for you and I to be the balm for people's souls. I believe hope abounds in such quantity that we can bring healing into the midst of grief by uniting our energy and our faith to become strong enough to accept the challenge of developing creative connection with our helpers. Let us become bearers of hope, because hope heals. Hope is a remarkable property of the human mind. Hope nurtures creativity, flexibility, and sees potential in new possibilities. Hope enables us to keep searching for the candy dish. I know that right now is still a very cold, dangerous time for many of us. A time in our lives, in our communities, in our nation, in our world. For us, here in Lan Lancaster County, the needle on the community health indicator is in the orange. And winter and the flu season are right around the corner. So let us pray to endure the snow and the cold of winter as we look forward to the buds of spring. We bring healing and become healers of hope and bearers of hope by telling stories about the pandemic and other losses in our lives. We bring healing by taking time to listen when others tell their stories. I believe part of the legacy the pandemic leaves us with is a collective responsibility 
to make sure stories are told in order to help our grief and that of future generations end up being more palatable. Songs, books, movie scripts, plays, research papers, and dissertations will be written about a time like this. Hope encourages us to tell the world that what is broken can be mended. Your life is a song. What new verse or verses will you sing? Your life is a book. Hope helps you to write the next chapters. Jeremiah bought a field when the wolf was about to come through the city gates of Jerusalem. And he bought that field in order to, to proclaim his faith in the future. It's not likely that any of us will go out and buy a field. But we may plant a tree or donate to causes that help lift children and families out of poverty. We may support Habitat for Humanity. We may give gifts to seniors or people sitting mission. We may write letters to persons who aren't seen and heard of and very, very often. Think about keeping a journal or creating a digital trail of videos and emails because sometime in the future, a grandchild or a great-grandchild or the child next door will come to you and say, my teacher told us there was something called a pandemic that happened a long time ago. What was it like? What did you do? Sharing helps to bring people and takes, takes the edge off grief. Sharing also reinforces the reality each of us is not alone. We are all in this together.
God be in your heart. The grace of God be in your words. The love of God be in your hands. The joy of God be in your soul. And in the song, your life sings.